remember our last trip together? You mean our first trip together? Yes, first trip. It was a real eye-opener. Um, we saw how they included children with special needs. Hold into on, hold the on. In case they do not know what we are talking about, let's pause for a minute. We're Jackie and Zui, two leaders from early childhood education and social services from Singapore. We went to Finland last summer for a very special series. What if you haven't? On inclusive education. Sounds like a big word, but the idea is really fundamental. And this time, I'm really excited to be in Canada to learn about their version of inclusive education. Could you tell us a little bit more about your school? I notice all these signs around that say, all are welcome. We had an assembly about all are welcome, meaning no matter how we look like and what we do to express ourselves, we all are welcome here in this school together. We have one grade six boy. Mm -hmm. He's been in our classes like since the beginning of kindergarten. He has autism and like I know what makes him upset mm -hmm. and then what calms him more down. Mm. You know in Singapore we have very different schools for learners like that so they are not in the same classrooms as their typically developing peers. I think that's actually very interesting because I've never heard of that because here we don't do that. Back in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the only option for education to people with disabilities, and I use the word education loosely there, was Woodland School. In the 1950s, seven family groups gathered, and their primary motivation at that time was having their loved ones come out of Woodland School to receive education in their neighborhoods as the family's expectations for the people that they love shifted, and we were able to drive similar policy shifts here in British Columbia. From that point on, the journey of deinstitutionalization began. It really picked up steam in about the 1970s and 80s. It was still in a very segregated model at that time. But at least that environment was nestled within the community rather in a separate institution. When we first moved to inclusion, there was resistance, both from the general education schools and from segregated schools, because it was a new change. So we didn't move everybody all at once. We worked with those people who really wanted it, and then gradually shrunk our special education school until it was closed completely. By the beginning of 2000, there were no special education public schools left in the province of BC. Yeah! Ten. Yep, finished. Very. Very. Which one says finished? Great job. <laughs> and so inclusion is also about citizenship. If children are not with each other, in community, then we're actually creating a stratified society that values some over others. So while it's challenging, it's also recognizing what every member of a community and every member of a family can offer. My friends are Spencer, Rory, Bethany, Tulsa. Spencer, and Dad, and Matt. I like playing outside with him. We do Lego together, play together. Sometimes I help him get Lego and I put his feet different ways because he can't really scrum around. It's easier, I find, to actually be friends with somebody with autism because I feel like I connect with them. I'm not sure how or why it's like that. Is it because you're familiar with it? It's a, quite a process getting to know them, but you have to learn, which I, I like learning about. <laughs>
I feel like if we compare our journey in the last 15 years to what uh, Canada has achieved since the 1950s, I really like to acknowledge how the Singapore journey has come to where we are now. The way SPAT schools have started, it really started with parents recognising that there is a need for us to provide education for children with special needs. One important thing that I picked up was really the move from institutionalization to where they are now in Canada. It's really parents themselves wanting an alternative service to what they had previously. And I think at this juncture in Singapore's development, as we talk about building community, I think it's pertinent that we really consider how we can have children with additional needs, young people with additional needs, adults with additional needs, be very much an integral part of society. And that's a conversation you and I are going to have in the future so that children's worlds will not be you know, divided into two separate worlds, but that they would have the mainstream educators and the special educators together working for the children, with the children, within one setting.